Well, I guess if you like to tell the history uh, of this lovely old church that we're in today, yeah. Reverend, uh, and let people know, uh, you know, uh, what's happened in the last sort of hundred years, if you can condense that for all of us. Sure. hundred years in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, St. Luke's Parish was incorporated in the... Um, first half of the 1890s and development of plans for a, a new building soon followed and under the leadership of the Reverend Joshua Hinchcliffe uh, construction began and that was in 1898 or 1899. Uh, construction took place over approximately six years and started in the east end of the building and began working its way west. The um, material used to construct the outside of the building was uh, locally quarried sandstone. And Joshua Hinchcliffe was the architect and the sort of master stonemason that uh, oversaw the project in addition to being the clergyman in charge of the parish. Uh, first service took place in the church in 1902 and that was a, a service of consecration so from that point on the church was uh, the building was a duly consecrated church in the um, in the Anglican Diocese of Calgary. Uh, over the years um, the church has been a, a part of the uh, landscape of downtown Red Deer. The uh, community within has always been people of, of service and, and action in the community. And it's uh, just, we're always told that it's a, it's a lovely old building and, and uh, sort of dear to the, the heart of people in Red Deer. So uh, we're, we're sort of banking on that for, for the future because uh, we know that uh, we don't necessarily have the resources to, to uh, do what needs to be done to preserve the structure of the building. Right now you're trying to raise money uh, to put a new roof on this lovely building mm -hmm. and uh, we, I got some good shots the other day of, of, of the shingles really starting to peel and, and it, actually some of them are actually starting to roll up quite badly yeah. and uh, so what's, what's the time frame that, that you need to, to, to get the money and to get the work done before there's any permanent damage or any damage at all to the church. Yeah. Um, well, you saw what condition the shingles were in. They probably should have been replaced 10 years ago. Uh, but sort of where we're at right now is um, 
the time frame is that it needs to be done immediately. And we're looking at having that work done in the middle of June of this year and providing everything falls into place. And the reason we're starting with the roof, I mean, our campaign initially is about the roof. We're calling it Raise the Roof, but it's really the, the tip of the iceberg. There's approximately a, a quarter million to $300,000 worth of work that needs to be done on everything under the roof in terms of the, the outside of the, the building. Um, restoration and remediation of sandstone. There's some structural issues with the foundation. And uh, that's, that's gonna take a, a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of money to be able to uh, bring it up to, to speed so that it will be around for future generations. The, um, one of the challenges we have is the material that the building is, is made of. And it's locally quarried sandstone but um, sandstone may have been available at the time, but it's not necessarily the best choice for, for buildings. It can, it can look nice, but um, in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of like building something out of butter. Mm -hmm. It's very susceptible to the elements and without ongoing TLC, it uh, can degrade very quickly. So that's sort of where we're at right now is uh, needing to, to give the the outside of the building, the TLC it needs to, to restore it and to uh, make it lovely again. And uh, also to uh, remedy some of the settling issues that we have with uh, some of the outer walls so that um, it'll stay standing for a, another 100 years and beyond. Yeah. And beyond and yeah. for, for many generations to come. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Reverend. That was very informative and uh, hopefully uh, everybody out there will uh, Put a helping hand towards the preservation of this uh, historical building. Yeah, we've uh, certainly had a lot of uh, good feedback from the community in terms of uh, stories and and uh, displays of sentimentality about the building. Um, heard a lot of stories about, you know, parents' weddings and, and oh, yeah. baptisms and other things that that have gone on here. So it uh, the the place does hold a, a special place in the hearts of people in this community. So. We're uh, kind of depending on that a little bit to uh, to help us. Pull, pull, yeah, you're pulling on their heartstrings a little bit. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. That's good. Well, my name is Michael Daw. I'm a Red Deer historian. Have been now for uh, four decades. Actually, maybe even longer than that. I uh, started with the Red Deer Archives in 1970 uh, and I've lived in Red Deer all my life. In fact, I'm a fifth generation Red Deer resident on um, both sides of my family. And we're standing in front of St. Luke's Anglican Church, the oldest uh, standing church still in Red Deer and probably one of the very most beautiful. My personal family connection to this church is that when my grandfather Daw passed away in May 1928, the funeral service was conducted out of this church because he was Anglican. Okay. And it really is a very beautiful church. Uh, I never knew the original rector who was uh, Canon Hinchliffe, Joshua Hinchliffe, because he died a long time before I was born, but uh, I did know his son, Arthur. Oh, okay. I knew his niece, who lived here in Red Deer, and uh, heard a lot of the stories of the church. One of the things was when they started building this church in 1899, and at that time, Red Deer wasn't even 300 people. So they didn't have much money, they didn't have a resources, pretty tiny corner, uh, congregation. Mm -hmm. So when they first built the church, they built the uh, east end first okay. and then if you look at an old picture and there's one on the sign in front of the church mm -hmm. kind of looks like a Lego set you know they built the the right. chancel and the nave and and a little bit of the of the thing they started that on September 1899 it's when they laid the first cornerstone and it's actually behind the hall now you can't oh, okay. see it anymore but it's there oh, okay. Okay. and then as the church continued to grow or the congregation grew and they were able to raise more money then in um, 1902, three, they added on the next chunk. Okay. And then in 1906, 
uh, they built the final, the biggest part of the sanctuary, and then they built the battlemented tower. But it was, uh, they, they had a professional architect uh, out of Edmonton who uh, did the design, but also uh, Canon Hinchliffe, the minister, had some architectural training. He also was a trained stonemason. Oh, okay. So when they were working on the church, he did quite a bit of the work himself. In fact, there's a story about a wedding. Uh, I think it was about 1903 when they were still under construction and the couple showed up and said, we'd like to get married. And they went looking for Canon Hinchliffe and he was in the back over here working. So he came out and he said, yes, he would do the ceremony. And uh, he had to change out of his construction clothes or maybe he just put the, the yeah. surplus over, to, over top of the work clothes. Yeah. And... Uh, they, uh, they walked up the aisle to the front of the church, but there was no roof over top of them until they got closer to the front altar area. And he conducted the service because uh, they were married. I guess they could say not only were they about the first people uh, married in the church, they were uh, actually married in the church before it really was finished. So, <laughs> But it really always was uh, considered a, a very grand church. Um, they used sandstone from a set of quarries that were on the west side of Red Deer along the river. In fact, you can still see the spots where the quarrymen used to cut the sandstone and every once in a while a piece would break loose and fall in the river and depending on the circumstances, you know, they would salvage it, but some of them they didn't. So if you look in the water, you can see the very square blocks that they had cut and then cracked or whatever still lying on the riverbed. Oh, okay. And then they would haul it by wagon and they built this building. There's a building on the corner of Gates and Ross that they built. The old Advocate building on 49th used the sandstone. It used to be a house over on uh, 55th Street that was the house of the man that owned the quarry, uh, Reinholdt. Oh, okay. But uh, by and large sandstone buildings were not common here because uh, the biggest uh, use for uh, sandstone at the turn of the last century was as foundation stone. So you didn't have concrete, and so people would use sandstone blocks for foundations because it was an expensive material to use. So you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't normally build a, try and build a whole building like this out of sandstone. You would just no. do the lower part. Yeah, exactly. But uh, starting oh, about in the first decade of the 1900s, then uh, concrete became common, became quite uh, available. There was a family out in uh, British Columbia named a Butchert, yeah. who were amongst the first people to sell uh, concrete in a big way, and of course yeah, they yeah. became extremely wealthy, and you have Butchert Gardens <laughs> in Victoria, which is yeah, yeah. named after them. Yeah. But uh, so the, the quarries had real trouble competing because they, the they just didn't have the, uh, you know, they were just a more expensive material. So yeah. people love the look of it. It looks very classy. But yeah. after 1910, it was very rare to see a sandstone building. If you're in downtown Calgary, you see them more often. Uh, they were good for fire resistance. Yeah. So in downtown Calgary on Stephen Avenue, the uh, uh, sandstone, you know, a lot of that was built in the 1880s and 90s, so you saw it more frequently. <coughs> but in Red Deer, we were starting to develop at the tail end, so just those few places like this one, when we were 300 people, that they had a grand plan or occasional other place. So this is a very rare building in terms of Red Deer sandstone. Uh, it has, you know, a sort of a Gothic or a Gothic revival style with the medieval style tower, the way it's laid out, you know, the big trusses in the inside, the extensive use of wood as a finishing. So you end up with a building that looks uh, very, very impressive, but also you get end up with a building that uh, has a warmth to it on the inside. And it, it, it's, a, it's a material that makes people feel comfortable, but also as you want with a church, with the sandstone, it looks very impressive. It creates a bit of sense of awe, it creates a bit of sense of reverence, and that's what helps make it such a landmark in the community. Okay, um, can you tell us about uh, the dilemma the church is in now with its uh, shingles and its roof, and there is other 
issues with the church, but we're starting with the roof, I guess. This yeah. is why we're all here. Yeah. yeah. Well, w one thing is, you know, St. Luke's is a beautiful church. It's a well-built church. You know, it's a, a real treasure in terms of its history and its architecture and the fact it's a rare use of Red Deer Sandstone. But one of the very unfortunate things about Red Deer River Sandstone is it's quite soft. It does not weather that well. It, it can crumble, it can crack. And, uh, you know, any building needs maintenance. I mean, wood buildings need paint and eventually that's not enough and you have to replace siding and things. But much the same here. One of the first things, because it takes the brunt of the weather, is a roof. Uh, so shingles need to be replaced, generally speaking, every 20, 30 years. Sometimes you can get them a little longer, sometimes they're a little less. But in this case, <coughs> excuse me, this building would need uh, it does urgently need a new shingle job, but there are problems going beyond that. There's places where the sandstone has crumbled a bit, there's cracking, there's shifting, um, and in the foundation uh, there's problems, for example, on the uh, west side of the building there used to be a tree there, it got very big, they took it out and removed it so you can't see it anymore, but the roots did a quite a bit of damage as they grew into the sandstone and, and broke it up. Also, there's uh, an old creek that runs under this oh. building oh. on the east side, oh, and yeah. it goes out, and if you're ever going over the 49th Avenue traffic bridge, if you look on the west side as you go north over the 49th Avenue bridge, you will see the creek as it comes out of the culvert and runs into the river. They, they, the creek is still there, they just largely buried it. Oh, yeah. But that causes shifting and moisture problems on the east side of this building. So they've, they've had those problems. Another thing is the quarry has been closed for over a hundred years. Uh, it would be astronomically expensive to reopen the old quarry. Uh, there are some places that have sandstone, but um, how do you match it? because if it comes from a different area, there might be a different color to it, a different texture. And so one of the problems is finding sandstone that you can use that will match properly, so that if you need to replace blocks, that you can do a nice match. And that's another big problem, and where they can find it, People want an astronomical amount for it. With the shifting, there's sashes of windows that need fixing. You don't want the beautiful 100-year-old stained glass windows cracking. Uh, there's just so many issues that uh, they have to deal with. It's a relatively small congregation. They're to be uh, congratulated and admired for all the huge amount of work that they've done, a lot of it volunteer work. But there's, you know, you might get people that will donate their labor for, let's say, repairing part of the roof but you still have to pay the cost of getting the shingles or getting the wood for the new trim or doing it. When the uh, building was designated a provincial historic resource in the 1970s, the, uh, the government did provide a little bit of money for some repairs. There was an old uh, uh, Native First Nations school west of Red Ray had been made out of sandstone, so they salvaged some of the sandstone oh, okay. from there. To be, but that's not available anymore. So where are you going to find the sandstone? Where are you going to find the people that have the masonry training to know how to do it in the tra in traditional way? Yeah. Where are you going to manage to do all these things? Yeah. Now, what about the shingles now? Um, how, the government is saying that it's, it's very important that they get on that right away. Yes, because once with sandstone and with old wood, as soon as you get moisture, the effects of it are going to be noticeable very quickly yeah, because yeah. old wood will absorb, it will soften, you have the problems with mold setting in, uh, you know, wet on the inside of the, because one thing about sandstone, at least where it's exposed to air, it does get a bit of a toughening to the exterior, but uh, where it's been protected more, it's going to be even softer therefore you have more of a problem with uh, deterioration. So there, he, uh, uh, Noel is very right. You, these are issues that they, you can't just say, well, we'll deal with that in 10 years or 15 years. You're going to have to deal with it right now. And uh, so that's why they, they, the congregation is doing what it could. Yes, they are applying for some government grants, but they're hoping that people will say, this church is part of us. You know, you don't have to be a member of this parish or this congregation considered important to our community. And they're hoping that the community as a whole will rally behind, maybe make 
a small donation, but if you get a thousand small donations, yeah. that can add up into pretty significant money. And we're just hoping that this kind of thing will help and uh, so that a hundred years from now when people look around saying, isn't that wonderful that beautiful old church is still there? It's still a real landmark in our community and that we had the foresight not just to say, okay, we're not going to tear it down, but nature and things of time is is a big thing if you don't do repairs you'll end up like the sandstone ruins and the old stone abbeys and churches in england where there, there's a haunting beauty to them but i don't think in the center of a modern city you're going to have the wreckage of an old building then you're just going to leave it there they, ha they have to maintain it they have to keep using it it has to have a reasonable use and it's going to take a lot of resources Beautiful old building, but it's going to take maintenance. And just as humankind, as we get older, we have to go to the doctor a little more often for some of the maintenance to us. Yeah, exactly. And uh, not any different for an old building. So we're really hoping that the community say, this is important to us. It'd be a tragedy if it disappears. So let's do something to see if we can't chip in a little bit and collectively do something to help save it.